let me just start with myself for a little bit. My mother's from Korea. My father's from Europe. Uh, we are all immigrants. I was born as a German citizen. Uh, and both my parents were in the military. All right. So starting from birth, uh, the military has impacted my life. I was born on a military, U.S. military base overseas in Germany. Uh, and, and that was in the mid-80s. And Germany was back then split into two, two countries, West Germany and East Germany, highly militarized countries. After that, I moved to Korea. Guess what? Another country split and highly militarized. Um, when I was about eight years old, I finally came to the States and I moved from military base to military base. Um, and then at the age of 19, I joined the military myself. And then when I was 25, I got out of the military. So, and then now I'm a disabled veteran. I go to the VA, the veteran of or VHA, Veterans Health Administration, which is a hospital for, strictly for veterans. Um, and that's where I get my health care from. Uh, and I have to seek treatment for certain disabilities. So what I'm saying here is my whole entire life has been impacted by the military. Um, just last year was the first time I went to a civilian hospital ever. Um, had no idea what that experience was. I always went to military hospitals. So my whole life has been in that military ecosystem. Um, and so being born and raised in the military family, you're kind of taught a lot of these patriotic beliefs that one should serve their country. They should join the military at some point, do a few years at least. Um, and that's that's basically what I did. But I didn't I didn't join I didn't join the military in the beginning for patriotic reasons. I actually joined because I needed a job. <laughs> um, when I graduated high school, I was in uh, southeast Georgia in the rural countryside. There was no opportunities, no businesses, no taxis, no buses, no trains, no subways, just dirt roads. My town had one stoplight. There's, you know, no, no schools to go to, uh, just a lot of churches and a lot of drugs. That was what my town was filled up with. Um, so when I graduated from high school, I was a construction worker, getting paid under the table, no health benefits. It was, uh, it wasn't good. And I hurt myself one day. Um, and it just made me really think about what I was going to do with my life. So I was like, you know what, if I'm working this hard as a construction worker, I might as well join the military and get some benefits out of it. And at that time, there was two major wars going on, the Afghanistan war and the Iraq war, right? Uh, these wars have been summed up as uh, the global war on terrorism. So anyways, I joined the military in 2004, two wars, Iraq and Afghanistan. These wars have completely destroyed Afghanistan and Iraq for generations to come. Whose lives were destroyed? Well, Iraqi students like yourself, fathers, grandmothers, grandchildren, homes have been blown up, schools have been blown up, businesses have been blown up, infrastructure, water, electricity blown up um, for decades. Right. So the, the majority of people who have died in Iraq and Afghanistan were innocent civilians that had nothing to do with terrorism, that had nothing to do with the U.S. military. That was my experience in Iraq and Afghanistan. I was in Iraq under President Bush, a Republican and a white guy. And I was in Afghanistan under President Obama, a Democrat. A black guy. Same policies, same failed policies, same failed wars, innocent civilians killed, uh, and corporations making a lot of money off of these wars. And I didn't realize how much of an impact these corporations had uh, until I was in Iraq and Afghanistan. When I was there, there was 
at one point more people that worked for corporations than there were people who worked for the U.S. military. Um, if you look that up, look up private con more private contractors in Iraq and Afghanistan than U.S. troops, you'll find there at a particular year, year there was many, many more private contractors. Um, and usually when they say the Iraq war ended or the Afghanistan war ended, the, these private contractors stay there. And these private contractors are basically just employees of huge corporations. It's a money-making business. And I thought I was there to save the world, to, to liberate the Iraqi people and the Afghan people. <clears throat> but later I learned it was really about making a lot of money and a lot of innocent people dying. It was a pretty dehumanizing experience. So a lot of people may think, oh, as long as I join the military and don't go to war, I'll be fine. Now, that's another myth. Um, if you ask anybody who's ever joined, you can ask an 88-year-old person and ask them about their basic training experience. I guarantee you they will remember everything about it. Why would they remember such, you know, 10 weeks of their lives at 88 years old? Well, it's a very traumatizing experience to go through just basic training. Not only do people yell at you, but um, yeah, there's just so many things to say about basic training. Uh, they break you down psychologically and they build you up into a soldier. And being a soldier means to stop thinking critically and to just obey the orders. That's essentially what turn, it kind of turn you into a robot. And they do that. They've had, you know, they've had so much time to refine their practice of basic training. Um, and they dehumanize you. They, they dehumanize other people. So things like racism, sexism are kind of pretty much promoted, not directly, but indirectly. Um, and the reason they do this is because they want you to think that the enemy is lower than human because it makes it easier to kill that person. Um, but that has consequences among your peers in basic training as well. Um, man, I saw people just pee and poop themselves because they were so traumatized at what was going on in basic training. Um, and yeah, just the way they, they treat you. You don't have to go to war to have a traumatizing experience in the military. Just joining the military itself has huge impacts on your life. And that actually happened to me. I signed up for four and a half years but they kept me in for over five and a half years. Um, it, at that time, they called it stop loss. So I actually did more time than what I signed up for. All right, so um, again, Iraq and Afghanistan, veteran 2004 to 2010. I was a sergeant when I got out. Um, some pictures of me in Iraq. I was a mechanic, by the way. Um, so not a very dangerous job, but my life was in danger in Iraq and Afghanistan every single day. Uh, we got attacked. Our bases got attacked almost every single day. Uh, I was in Iraq for 15 months and I was in Afghanistan for 12 months. So over two years of my life has been in a combat zone. Um, and this is, this is my life. Like after the military, I've gotten to travel the world uh, protesting against the U S military you know, the United States of America began in 1776. So since 1776, the U.S. has been at war 228 years out of 245, right? Well, those numbers should change because it's the new year now. So here's a list. If you don't believe me, 1776, war, war, war. A lot of these wars are against indigenous people, right? It's not like the, the settlers came over and everything was happy-go-lucky. Uh, people were killed and slaughtered. Land was taken. So right from the beginning, the United States being, began as a project of violence over other people. Next slide, 1834 all the way to 1866. 
Texas Indian Wars, the Seminole Wars, uh, American Civil War, right? Next slide. Continuing Cheyenne War, uh, the U.S.-Mexican War, Apache Wars, U.S. forces invade Hawaii, the Philippine-American War and the Banana Wars in Latin America. Let's see. Finally, we get, okay, here's like 1935 to 1940. Here's a stretch of no major wars. But then World War II begins, and the Cold War, then the Korean War, then the Vietnam War. Uh, and finally, our last slide. Here's the War on Terror beginning in 2001. And since then, just country after country after country with U.S. troops in it. So, yeah, I think that's important to understand. The U.S. has pretty much always been at war. Okay, so I think U.S. military bases is an important, important aspect to know about this infrastructure. Uh, 800 military bases. Okay, a lot of them are very small. These, you see these small dots? They're called lily, lily pad bases. You know, it could be like under 50 personnel each base, but it could have a missile there. It could have a radar, et cetera. Um, these bigger dots with the stars on them, those are the bigger bases that we may hear about with up to tens of thousands of soldiers on them, troops on them. Um, and also to keep in mind, there's uh, these aircraft carriers, these naval ships that are basically huge cities on water just floating around the world constantly, uh, nuclear powered, and they have nuclear power weapons on them. Um, so the whole entire world is kind of patrolled by the U.S. military. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, I wish I could go into more about this because this is more about the, the politics of these military bases. So when there's a military base in South Korea, they sign a contract to have those military bases there. Part of that contract says if there is environmental pollution from the military base, it's not the U.S.'s problem. South Korea has to clean it up. Oh, also, South Korea has to uh, give us electricity, land, materials to build, barracks, and different buildings. Um, and at the same time, you know, what happens if a U.S. soldier commits a crime in South Korea? Uh, a big thing that happens is what happens when you get 18-year-old men uh, full of testosterone. They've been in basic training and other types of training for six to 10 months straight. Um, they've been filled with the idea that they are going to save the world, that they are big, strong, tough men, and that they are patriotic and that they are providing a service to the world. And then they get stationed in South Korea, and then it's Friday night. And they can drink over there, right? Well, they go out and they party pretty hard. Uh, and then a lot of sexual violence is committed against the local populations. This, it's really big in Japan and South Korea, but it's pretty much where any base is. And what happens then? Who takes this soldier or troop to court? Does the South Korean government do it or does the U.S. government do it? Well, in a lot of cases, when that happens, the U.S. will immediately take that soldier and ship him back to the United States so that the South Korean government cannot prosecute or take this person to court to charge them with that crime that they committed. Um, and sometimes it goes as far as killing people. Um, a lot of cases involved uh, U.S. soldiers. Um, committing sexual violence and then killing a young woman and sometimes a young girl and uh, not being tried in that country because they've been immediately flown to the United States to, to be protected. Um, in 1995 in Okinawa, a 12-year-old girl uh, was raped and killed by two Marines and one uh, sailor, one seaman. Uh, yeah. 12-year-old girl. 
um, just in 2016, a private contractor in Okinawa who was formerly a Marine Corps, a Marine, um, raped and killed a 16-year-old girl. Right? These are some of the bigger cases that we hear about, but, but honestly, hundreds of these things happen every single year. We just don't hear about it because there's always like this myth about the military that has promoted it towards us, uh, towards you, through Hollywood movies, through mainstream media, what our government and politicians say, uh, et cetera, right? They don't want us to know about this side of the military. They want us to know about this myth of the military that we are here, as a uh, student said earlier, to save the world. So anyways, let me say this one slide. How many military bases does every other country have? So if you add up all other overseas military bases, from Germany, from France, from India, from the UK, from South Korea, from Israel, from China, from Russia, you only get to about 100 military bases total when the US alone has 800 military bases. And militarism, it's an ideology, uh, impacts us in so many different ways. One of the ways it impacts us is that our local police departments are militarized. I think it's important to understand this. This picture kind of talks about the question I asked about where Black Lives Matter started. 2014, in the state called Missouri, in a city called Ferguson. This is where Mike Brown Jr. was shot. By the way, black folks have been getting shot by the police for s too long. But for this particular incident in 2014 in Ferguson, Missouri, uh, it really blew up. And people started the protest over this young black man getting killed. And uh, it was pre predominantly in a black city. And they started to protest and ask questions. What the heck is going on here? And the police responded in a very heavily militarized manner. If you look on the left, the tan up armor vehicle that's made for a war. <laughs> uh, and you look on the right, the black tan similar vehicle, but painted black that's made for war but deployed into a civilian city in the United States, particularly a black city. Like we really need to emphasize that. Um, with, uh, uh, not soldiers, but uh, police officers carrying assault rifles that are made for war, right? They are militarized to the core. They have the boots, the uniforms, the gloves, the helmets. They're wearing uh, bulletproof vests. They have assault rifles. They have sniper rifles. <laughs> Look at this sniper guy on the top. They have up armor vehicles that are made for bombs to be blown up. Right. And this is going into 2014 Ferguson, Missouri. This is where Black Lives Matter started. Right. So all this military gear. The funding, the training goes completely free to local police departments across the country. Not only does the equipment go with them, this ideology of saying the way we solve problems is through this violent force. And that's, as your teacher was saying, militarism, an ideology. It's a program for action. That's the way they believe things should be resolved. Suicide. Huge. Uh, 60, over 60,000 veterans have committed suicide in the past decade. Um, yeah, that, that's just wild. Uh, so, and then that's, so if you think about how many troops have died in the wars overseas in the past decade, it is uh, less than 8,000. Less than 8,000. But 60,000 veterans have committed suicide. So what that says is if you join the military, you have a higher chance of dying by suicide than you do by dying overseas in a war. What is going on here?
Why are veterans committing suicide? Right. That's something to think about moving forward. If you ever think about the U.S. military or the experiences of troops and veterans. All right. So back to sexual assault, sexual violence in the military. So one in three women are, are uh, have sexual violence committed against them. This is different than sexual harassment. I would argue 100 percent of women have sexual harassment against them in the U.S. military. Uh, but as far as sexual assault, physically being assaulted, one in three women. So if you see three women veterans, it's most likely at least one of them have had some type of sexual violence committed against them. And who does this? Their fellow soldiers, their fellow peers. And in a lot of cases, it's their boss. It's their supervisor. It's their squad leader. It's their platoon sergeant. It could be their company commander. So, you know, I have both my hands, both my legs, uh, haven't really physically been injured too much. Um, more of my injuries have been psychologically. Uh, I have PTSD um, and I suffer from moral injury, which is another thing. But uh, basically, let me just tell you this for 15 months straight, uh, for two times every day, for two times a day. Everybody knows what happens next, right? An explosion, a bomb. Uh, so every single day that would happen. Uh, we've had people that were blown up and were burned alive. Uh, we have people who lost legs and arms. Um, we had people who were in the shower and an explosion went off and they had to run around naked to get to a bunker. Um, just constant threat of being blown up and just not knowing where it's going to come from. Right. Um, not to mention having friends, people, you know, that are close to you uh, get killed in all kinds of different ways. It's, it's really wild how people can die. You know, one, one friend was helping a big semi truck just back up to park and they got stuck between a wall and the truck and their head got smashed um remember if if you're working 14 16 18 hour days and you only get one day off per month after eight months you get very very tired and you can't think straight and and then you have a mission that goes until two or three o'clock in the morning and then you have to park the car right a, a lot of things happen so um yeah psychologically i have ptsd um, and I have to deal with things like that, sleeping problems, uh, anger issues, um, depression, being isolated and, uh, alienated because people don't even understand <laughs> these things, right? If I get, you know, I'm talking about all these experiences in the military and most people are like, well, America should, should go out there and drop these nuclear bombs or send these troops over there and do this and do that because this is America and we're the greatest country in the world. You know, when almost everyone out there is almost talking like that, it's hard to kind of live with yourself uh, because, like, they have no idea what it's like over there. They've been told a story from a Hollywood movie that is totally based off of just fake ideas, off of mythologies. And on a daily basis, that really, it's hard to connect with people, you know, and I have to deal with that. I'll probably be dealing with it for the rest of my life because I've met veterans from the Korean War who are 90 years old and they still deal with it. And they've told me, they're like, listen, you're going to deal with it forever. And I only did five and a half years in the military and it's going to impact me for the rest of my life. I, can't, I haven't even gotten a job since getting out of the military. People don't want to hire veterans. Veterans are just as unemployed as uh, black folks and indigenous folks, right? So black folks and indigenous folks don't get jobs because of racism in this country. Well, veterans don't get jobs because everyone actually knows that we're crazy or thinks that we're crazy. Even though there's a myth that like veterans, veteran discount at the store or whatever, right? It's, it's all a lie. If you look at the statistics, it's a completely different story. 
veteran suicides are high, uh, veteran unemployment is high, all this stuff. So just think about it critically and look all this stuff up if you want. It's on YouTube, it's on Instagram, it's, there's websites, there's articles, there's books. Question, um, I haven't had children yet. Uh, surprisingly, I'm, a, I'm about to. Um, would I let them join? I mean, no. Oh, yeah, 100%. So I was in uh, Iraq in 2006, 2007, when President Bush announced the surge. The surge was basically, oh, the war is failing. So the president's like, okay, we're just going to send more troops, more money, more weapons. We're going to surge everything. And so we were there for the surge. And just after months and months of fighting, like it was just like, what are we doing here? There's like nothing good no benefit coming out of this like we're not winning people are just dying like it's just horrible um and we would just like sit there late at night you know smoking cigarettes looking at the sky just being like what how did i get into this place it's just, it was just like we just had no idea what was going on and they they weren't telling us what was going on. they were just like just fight the enemy you're saving the world, you're liberating the Iraqi people just over and over. And it's just like, well, obviously this isn't happening because a lot of people were dying and nothing good is happening.